side of the road here. Um, as you can see, it just drops off and there's an avalanche that goes down hundreds of meters. It's super dangerous. Um, that's one thing I like about Mexico because you kind of take responsibility for your own safety. And um, I've never had a problem there. I just camp out every night and you know go through the forest every day. And the you know, Mexican people are really cool, and um, the mushrooms there are really good. So the, in Mexico, there's hundreds of species of oaks and hundreds of species of pine trees, and the mushroom diversity follows the tree diversity. So. Um, like in California, when I go mushroom hunting, if I hunt for a solid month, I'll find maybe one or two really interesting new things. Uh, but in Mexico, there's one or two really interesting new things every day. And this is one of the places that I go is the cloud forest in Jalisco. So there's a lot of different mushroom habitats in Mexico, but my favorite one is the cloud forest. And the cloud forests are places that are about 1,500 to 2,000 meters elevation. And they are really unique in that about 3 p.m. every day, the clouds roll in. And so even if it doesn't rain, they get a whole lot of humidity. And then it usually rains um, just for real quick in the afternoon every day, too. But it's not the jungle. It's not hot. It's, um, it's pretty temperate, kind of like where I live in, in Oakland, uh, where it's you know, 60s and 70s in the day and 40s in the night. And this is Fulvio. And Fulvio is my friend that I met on the shroomery. And Fulvio is um, a biologist who was living in Guadalajara, and he was posting pictures of Psilocybe zapatacorum, which are magic mushrooms that can get about this tall. And if you've seen the magic mushrooms that grow around here, they're about this tall. So I was like, wow, i got to go to Mexico and see these things. So I messaged him and was like, hey, can I come hunt mushrooms with you? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so I just, uh, flew into Guadalajara, and he met me at the airport, and he even spoke English. It was really cool. But within an hour, we were in his Psilocybe Saber Lessons patch, and they were just everywhere, and I was pretty hooked by that. Here's the most dangerous bridge in Mexico. Um, <laughs> goes through a you know, really, uh, really angry river there. Um, but yeah, they fixed it was by putting a log across. And of course, it just rolls off from under your feet. So you know, in this country, they would have demolished that thing for liability reasons long ago. Uh, but in Mexico, they just put up like 50 cents worth of barbed wire. <laughs> and this is my friend Alonzo. Um, Alonzo is a really good mycologist. And he was studying with Gaston Guzman, who was the world expert in psilocybe and passed away a couple years ago. So now Alonzo is the world expert in psilocybe. And I now I take him all over Mexico and showed him all of my cool spots that I've discovered. And um, we are publishing a whole bunch of uh, scientific papers together, the most recent one. Um, is about 23 species of bioluminescent mushrooms that actually glow in the dark that we uh, discovered in the state of Veracruz. And there's not just cool mushrooms in Mexico, there's really cool insects and birds and wildlife as well. This is a dia ethria, they call it ochenta ocho. And then here's a glass wing butterfly just hatching out of its chrysalis. And a neil, leaf, uh, neil tree hopper. Those really cool pink eyes. Little tiny little thing. Um, so what I do is I pick a whole bunch of mushrooms and then I put them in paper bags and I write a collection number on the paper bag, which is usually the number off my camera, so I always know which photo goes with which dried mushrooms. And then I throw them up on the dashboard and then drive around for about a week, and that dries them out. And once they're dry, then I put them in um, like a Tupperware that has desiccant in there so they don't get rehumidified and get moldy the next time it rains. Mm -hmm. And when it's time to go back to the United States, I leave all my clothes in Mexico and stuff my suitcase <laughs> full of mushrooms. <laughs> and you might think that'd be a problem at customs, but it hasn't been so far. Uh, one of the reasons is that you're allowed to bring mushrooms into the country, but you're not allowed to bring dirt or meat or food or um, plants. <clears throat> So um, I guess there's you know, mushroom growers, they pasteurize and sterilize a lot of stuff, so they're not worried about you know, mushroom pathogens coming in so much. Um, so you know, they might complain about the dirt or something, but you don't really have to declare them because they didn't buy them or anything like that. So I just check down in all the boxes and go right through customs. And then when I get back, I take them to Counterculture Labs, which was the biohacker space in Oakland. And um, it's the world's largest biohacker space. And according to somebody who's been there, um, been to all of them, it's one of the coolest. And so we do all sorts of science stuff there. And it's open to the public. We got all sorts of chemicals and laboratory equipment. So I do a lot of microscopy there. 
and um, even more importantly, DNA sequencing. Um, so here we are extracting, extracting the DNA from mushrooms. Uh, we just take a little bit of the mushroom, like 30 milligrams, even less sometimes, and grind it up and use sodium hydroxide to extract the DNA, get it in a solution, and then load it into PCR reaction. So each of these is a different mushroom extract. And um, so there's like 90, you do 96 at a time. And we load that into a thermocycler, which copies the gene of interest, and you get billions of identical copies of each of the DNA molecules. And then after the thermocycle is done, we load that into an electrophoresis gel. And so it's like jello. And so you put one sample in each of these little wells and put a 100 volt DC across it and then throw it on a black light and get the result. And if you get uh, the bar, it looks kind of like a minus symbol there. That means that it worked. And you can take it to a um, sequencing place. So there's this box in Berkeley. Um, just like 10 minutes away, and if I get it into this black box, it looks like a mailbox by 6 p.m., then I get the DNA sequence uh, of the mushroom back in my email the next morning. So you're getting the whole DNA sequence, not just one gene? Just one gene, because the whole gene DNA sequence is like $2,000, but um, I'm getting one gene, it's called the internal transcribe spacer, it's the first pass, because that's the most variable gene. So it works really well as a barcode to discover new species and stuff. Um, if I wanted to get the whole DNA sequence, you know, it costs a lot more, and I don't even know what I'd do with all that data. So what I, what I get is this chromatogram, and it's about 600 characters. It usually comes back, and you can take that and paste it into NCBI Blast, and that compares your sequence. Yeah, go ahead. How much does it cost for your ITS sequence? Like $8. Wow. So um, it's not very much. It's almost free compared to how cool the data is. Because <laughs> you paste that into Blast, and it compares your sequence with every other sequence that's ever been submitted to GenBank. And you see if there's a 100% match, you see where else in the world your mushroom has been found. And if there's no 100% matches, then you see the closest relatives. And so like, if you don't know if it's poisonous or not, if all the close relatives are edible, then you know almost 100% chance your mushroom is edible. And if all the close relatives are poisonous, then it's almost certainly poisonous. Because all the poisonous ones and edible ones group together. This one here is a Mycena, and you can see there's 25 differences between my sequence and the others. And that means this is a new species, because 25 differences out of like 600 is really quite a few. Um, so that's Mycena epipetigera, and it's a name from Italy. And um, so we can see that the Mexican version is different and needs a new name, but it doesn't have a new name yet. So for now, I'm just going to call it Mycena epipetigera. How many differences constitute a species? It's really hard to say because, you know, species is an artificial concept and you just, you know, it's like all of the galaxies in the universe are moving apart and all of the species in the universe, in, on Earth are moving apart. And, you know, one day, you know, it's a new species and the day before, not. But it's really up to you what, what can, constitutes a new species in your mind. So nobody can tell you what a species is. It's not like animals where if they can mate and have a fertile offspring, they're a species. Um, I like to see three unrelated differences. So usually, I would say if there's like five differences in the ITS, it's usually a different species. But um, it really depends on like the morphological features. What do you and mean by unrelated? What's that? What do you mean by unrelated? Like, like maybe different spore size, like different mic you know, mic microscopic features, maybe macroscopic features. Just like three different, kind of, three different things that I can notice about it that's different from its closest relative. That I'm like, yeah, I might as well call that something else. So then you can download all of the closely related sequences uh, in GenBank and load them into um, this uh, alignment here and then calculate with maximum likelihood a phylogenetic tree. And here is the phylogenetic tree that I did at Psilocybe. So this is all the magic mushrooms in the world. And the ones that in blue are the ones, um, the sequences from Mexico. And you can see how they're all related and how each mushroom that you find fits into the whole tree of life. So there's a lot of really cool edibles in Mexico. This one is Havela Crispa. And then this one here um, turns out to be a slime mold. And it took forever to identify it, but I finally just put it under the microscope. And yeah, definitely a slime mold, really crazy looking one. And there's really cool Xyleria in Mexico. So well, Xyleria grows on wood. And um, it's kind of really hard, woody type things. Pretty hard to identify. This one's easy, Xyleria tenticulata from the tentacles, uh, but a lot of Xylerias require microscope or DNA work to figure out which ones they are. And this one's kind of like Xyleria cubensis. 
name from Cuba. Uh, Zylaria, this one is Zylaria liquid amberis, because it always goes on liquid amber seed pods. Edible. Um, they're a little bit too tough to eat, but if you have very sharp teeth and very <coughs> strong jaws, they're edible. <laughs> but down here is a liquid amber seed pod, so that's like the liquid amber, the same species of liquid amber that we get uh, all over around here. And then this one grows on chestnut, like chicken pin type seed pods. And here's a Romaria, um, maybe actually Lentaria, because this one is not mycorrhizal, it just grows on the death. But they call these patitas de pajaro, bird's feet. And they're really commonly sold in markets. Um, in this country, people are really scared of Romaria because Romarias are really hard to identify, and some of them cause like a little bit of stomach issue. But in Mexico, they just eat all the Romarias and don't worry about it. <laughs> and this one's pretty cool, um, Hydnoproliferus fimbriatus. It's kind of, uh, kind of tough, so you probably don't really eat it that much, but it's cool looking. And then this on the right is a spider um, there. And then on the left is the cordyceps uh, fruiting out of it. So the cordyceps described from spiders is Ophiocordyceps uh, specocephala. But actually, um, no, it was cordyceps calosoroides. But I gave this collection to this lady in uh, Mexico City who's doing DNA sequencing on all the cordyceps. And she said it's actually a new species. So this one I found in Oaxaca. And I always go back to the exact spot that I found it every year to try to collect it again. But it hasn't been there. It's super rare. I've only seen it once. This is Ophiocordyceps specocephala, and it grow, always grows from wasps. And then this one I don't have a name for, but I dug it up. There was some kind of coleoptera bug under it. Maybe Isaria. And this one's kind of pretty cool. It's like Cordyceps militaris. <laughs> um, but when I found it, it was just growing out of a twig, and I know that cordyceps never grows from twigs, so I very carefully cut it open with a razor blade, and you can see that there is this really neat kind of bug in the middle of there, and um, and then it, uh, the mycelium just kind of went both directions trying to look for an exit, and then there was just like a natural hole up there, and so it found that hole from probably by looking for the light and also looking at the CO2 levels, and then it's fruited right out of there. And here's another thing in the Cordyceps militaris group. And I put it onto agar, and you can see that it turns yellow on the agar, just like it does uh, in the field. And these fruit pretty well just on rice. And here's some scleroderma. These are some of the biggest sclerodermas in the world. It's scleroderma texensi. Um, they're about softball size. And they're poisonous. Um, rumor is, is that it's only the inside that's poisonous. So if you eat the outside, the white part, it's edible. I would try it, but just a little bit at first. <laughs> and then this smells terrible. This is a Bluminavia. And it smells like rotting meat and hatches out of an egg. And they're super rare, even in Mexico. Here's Clathos crispus. And these also attract flies that smell like rotting meat, and they hatch out of eggs. And Acerora rubra, um, this is a picture I took in Veracruz, but it is native to Australia. And this one is like Phallus enduziatus. Um, when I found this collection, none of them had hatched out yet. There were only eggs. So I cut the eggs open, and you can see um, the you know, the stink horn is starting to hatch over there. And so the whole pile of them, I put it back. <laughs> but this is what they turn into, the like phallus enthusiatus type thing. And this one, the very top of it, it smells terrible, but it's like nauseatingly sweet. And then the nut part smells like rotting meat. And so I brought it back in a sequence of DNA, and it matched 85% with phallus, phallus enthusiatus. <laughs> which is really far, actually. So it's actually nowhere near Phallus enthusiatus. It's some new species from Caretero. And then here's the mushroom that causes just a ton of mushroom poisonings. You probably all have seen it a million times. Chlor Chlorophyllum molybdites. And it's one of the few mushrooms that has green spores. So you can see the green spore print there on the other caps. And it's also the gills are starting to turn green as the spores mature. Looks just a little bit like Psilocybe cubensis, so really wishful thinking. We'll have people eating it thinking it's a magic mushroom. 
Uh, it won't kill you, but it'll make you wish you were dead for about a day. And then you're fine. <laughs> Here's some bird's nest fungi. I thought it looked really cool because they look like silver coins in there. Um, but the raindrops fall down and splash the spores out of the cups. And this is a new one that I found just this summer. Um, I had the scene before, Aluriodiscus. It's a genus that we don't have in California. I'm pretty sure you do have them here in South Carolina. And this is a really crazy one. I really like it. It's called Rhodorrhenia, and it smells like sulfur. And when you flip it over and look in there, it looks like that. So it's um, really unique, and sometimes you like lift up a log, and there's just thousands of them on the underside of a log. Hold that one right there for our morale training, please. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of similar. And there's a lot of porcinis in Mexico. Uh, probably about 15 different species of porcinis, and as far as I know, all of them are new species. So I've been uh, bringing a lot of them back and sequencing the DNA on them, and every time I get a sequence back from these, they, they never match anything else. Um, yeah, I got like, one of them matched a the name from Costa Rica once, but almost all of them are new. And the porcinis in Mexico always go at a really high elevation, which might be why they're so rare here. Um, but you go there at like 3,000 meters, they can be everywhere. And sometimes you'll see people with baskets just full of them. And you can go to restaurants and order them. And on the menu, they usually uh, bread them and deep fry them. And they're super good. Yeah? I found a uh, bully in the Yeah, those would be totally different. Um, so there's so many different bullets in Mexico. And I only had time to put a few of them in, in this talk. Um, but the bullets in, in the lower elevations, I've never seen a porcini at lower elevations, but there's a lot of different bullies that do grow at lower, like tropical bullies. They're usually a little bit smaller. These were actually really big and meaty. Um, they taste a lot like bacon if you cook them really good. Whereas um, you know, a lot of the smaller ones you know, have all sorts of different flavors and stuff. Um, turns out all of the poisonous ones stay in blue or have red pores. So if they don't stay in blue or have red pores, they'll be edible. Otherwise, if they do stay in blue or have red pores, you have to either identify the species or sequence the DNA and see if it's related to poisonous ones or the edible ones. This is one I found in Oaxaca. And when I sequenced it, it was like really close to Boletus pinophilus. It's not quite the same as Boletus pinophilus, which is a European species, but it's, it's really close. And this one has a really strong smell, but also a porcini. You can tell it's a porcini because it has this net-like pattern on the stipe. So uh, all the porcinis do that. They call it reticulation. Here's a Strabillomyces. And Strabillomyces, they call them old man of the woods. And they're really cool because they're all new species because no one's ever described any Strabillomyces except for one from South Carolina. But we have like at least five or six species here. And you know, only one of them is known to science. The rest of them are new species, so definitely waiting for somebody to do work on Strabillomyces. Um, when I take pictures, <coughs> I like to take a picture, just throw a ruler in there. That way I don't have to take a lot of measurements, but I can write my species descriptions later on. And it's good to cut one in half so you can see what the inside looks like, see all the staining. And then we also put potassium hydroxide on them, and that changes the colors in them. In this case, it just took the right away. Uh, but the color change with potassium hydroxide is valuable information as well. Here is Areo boletus rucellii, which is edible, cooks up kind of slimy though. It uh, has a really cool texture on the stems. And Austroboletus gracilis grows at high elevation under pines. Another good edible. And then Boletus dupanii is poisonous. Um, so this has red pores and it stains blue. Um, so that's a good indication that it's probably poisonous. But this one has red pores and it stains blue and it's edible. Uh, it's, it's edible. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Boletus, um, I forget the name of this one, but uh, Boletus luriniformis vardiscolor. And so if you sequence the DNA on that dupanii one, you'll see it comes, in the, comes out in the middle of a whole bunch of poisonous ones. Whereas you sequence this one and it comes out in swellellus. And Swillelis is a genus that has red pores, like the Satan's bolides, but unlike the Satan's bolides, it's not even closely related, just kind of convergent evolution. And um, so you can eat these, but you cut them open and they stain sky blue almost instantly, like within a second. So they're really cool looking. I found these in Oaxaca. And then these bolides are pretty cool, uh, pulverobolectus, and they have a really neat veil on them that's yellow. 
the red pores. And then this one had never been found in Mexico until Alonso and I found it last August. And it's uh, Pseudobolitis parasiticus. And the cool thing about it is that it sprouts from scleroderma, which are these poisonous pop balls. So you can see they got purple in the middle if you cut them open. And the bullies are just sprouting out of these puff balls. And then on the left, you have Xeracomelis. And on the right uh, is Hypomyces microspermis. And that they call it, the common name is bully eater. It parasitizes the Xeracomelis. And first they turn white. And then they turn bright golden yellow with all the spores. And then this one is Phyllobolitis. Uh, not really a bully, more closely related to Mycena. Super rare, I've only seen it once. Was that name uh, after they did the genetics on it? No, it's an old name. Oh. And yeah, so you know the genetics, we've been doing it for about 20 years. Why did they put it in the leaks if it doesn't look anything like um, they They kind of like used to classify stuff just on morphology before. So when it has pore, anything with pores, they would put in boletus. And then, you know, now we can see how everything really is related, so now everything's getting switched around. Um, but, you know, the, 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 these names that got published a couple hundred years ago, they still apply because the first name to get published takes priority. So we still call it that, even though it's not a bully. The last bully we'll look at is Chalciparus in the middle here. And Chalciparus goes with Amanita muscaria, and it's actually parasitic on the Amanita muscaria. So whenever you find Chalciparus, you always find Amanita muscaria, at least the mycelium around. And Amanita muscaria likes to grow with the pines. So you also see the Boletus edulis um, there on the right, this mycorrhizal with the pine. So Amanita muscaria is poisonous, and it's really delicious. Um, so I like to slice it and fry it up in butter and eat it. And when I serve it, I serve like six bites. And if you eat six bites of this, nothing happens. It's just like a really good mushroom. But if you eat like 10 or 12 bites, you start to feel like you drank a couple beers and maybe throw up. So if you're having a really good day and you want it to turn into a bad day, Amanita muscaria is like the best mushroom to take for that. <laughs> um, you can also parboil it and all of the poisons and drugs, um, the same molecule as the poison and the drug, goes into the water and then you can saute it and then you can serve a whole lot more than six bites, but it takes most of the flavor out too. So then the chef can add flavor back in by putting like MSG and all sorts of teriyaki sauce or whatever, but um, it's really better just not to parboil it and only serve a really tiny bit. And then here's Amanita pantherina, and this has the same drugs as Amanita muscaria, but maybe a little bit stronger. You can tell because it has the brown cap and then it has that collar on the base of the stem. And Amanita gemata, um, also in that group. And Amanita zygmina vulva um, also has uh, the drug muscamol in it. It's pretty unpleasant. And the last thing from Amanita suction Amanita is Amanita rosea tincta, which is cool because it has all this powder all over it, like covered in orange powder. And that's one that you see on the East Coast. So you'll see a lot of East Coast mushrooms in Mexico. And that's because if you look at Google Maps, there's all this green in the east, and then that green continues down through Texas all the way down into Oaxaca and southern Mexico. And so a lot of species can just travel down through that forest, and you find a lot of East Coast stuff there. But I don't find any California, like West Coast things in Mexico. Yep? What about Gulf Stream? Does it bring stuff up? To us yeah, but you know, if, you're, if the spores are traveling through the air, you need two spores of the same species to land really close to each other. So mushrooms don't really travel very far through the wind. Um, they do a whole lot better traveling like with animals, because an animal will bring like hundreds of spores at once. Um, and also water does a really good job of spreading mushrooms around. So that was Amanita suction Amanita, and now we have Amanita suction Validae. And suction Validae is edible if you cook it, but the poison is raw. And there's a lot of really delicious species in suction Validae. Here is Amanita rubescens. And rubescent means staying red in Latin. So these, wherever you damage them, they turn red. And this is one of my most my favorite mushrooms to eat in Mexico. They taste really good. It's kind of hard to describe. It's kind of like a white fish, but without the fishy flavor. Um, you just feed them people, and they just want more. They're just really good. Here's Amanita flavoconia. <coughs> Amanita flavoconia, uh, a lot of the books say it's poisonous, but I've seen it in the markets in Mexico. 
And if you just go into GenBank and download an Amanita flavicornia sequence and blast it, you'll see all the close relatives are edible, like rubescens and everything else in Validae. So that means it's edible, and I've eaten it a bunch of times now, and it's really good. This one almost looks like a face. <laughs> That's good. And here's some Amanitas from Section Caesarea. They, um, these are really cool because they're all edible. They all have annulus on the stem. And they hatch out of eggs. So you can see an egg in the very left. And then there's an egg that I cut in half. And you can see the mushroom just starting to form inside there. And then they hatch out of the egg and get really big. And these are really popular. Even if you don't know anything about mushrooms in Mexico, you, you know these. And people just hit the brakes when they see them on the side of the road. You can order them in restaurants. Do they serve them raw on salads? No, they, they cook them. But you can serve them raw on salads. There's nothing that will get you in Amanita section cesarea. Yeah, I mean, the section validate, you definitely don't want to eat raw, but section cesarea, yeah, it's totally fine. In fact, um, you know, everyone says you're supposed to cook every mushroom, but it's not really true. It turns out that most mushrooms you can get away with eating raw, but there's a bunch of exceptions, like morels, you definitely get sick if you eat, if you eat them raw. A lot of people have problems with, like, uh, oyster mushrooms, raw, bluets, and a few other ones, but for the most part, most people can eat most mushrooms. Uh, raw. And a lot of people say that they have chitin in them, so you can't digest the chitin. But your body also can't digest cellulose. So I think uh, I think it's kind of overblown and it's actually okay to eat mushrooms raw. But not everything. And then this is cordless negrescens. Um, I don't see a lot of rattlesnakes in Mexico, but occasionally I'll see them. They don't really bother me. They're pretty nice. Um, unless you bother them. You don't want to like pick up the rattlesnake and set it down in front of mushrooms for a photo, <laughs> which is what we did here. <laughs> yeah. So Amanita bossy eye is also really good edible. They see in restaurants, and you cut open a lot of these other ones, and they have a hollow stem. Most of the deadly ones have solid stems, and the base of the stem is way different. So. Um, the really easy way to tell these edible ones from the deadly amanitas is if you, um, this base of the stem is called a vulva, and if you peel away that vulva, the stem itself is actually equal and it's not, there's no bulb at all. Whereas with the deadly mushrooms, if you peel away the vulva, the stem itself is actually bulbous and it, like, that doesn't peel away. Here's another one. This looks like a deadly mushroom because it's white. But again, if you peel away the vulva, it's totally equal. It has, this, um, it has the, <clears throat> the stem, the tallow, and also a striate margin. A lot of the edible amanitas have a striate margin, whereas the deadly amanitas only have a striate margin if it's been rain, rained on really hard. Yep. What is the um, death rate from eating amanitas and mushrooms? Uh, it used to be really bad. It used to be like half of the people that ate them uh, died. And the reason you die is because if you eat a deadly mushroom, um, like... Let's see, this is edible here, but also edible from section Lepidella. Uh, actually, yeah, section Lepidella I wouldn't eat, but these are deadly here. So these, they have a protein in there called aminitin, and it stops the messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA is really important because what your body uses to synthesize proteins. So if you eat one of these, you're fine for 12 hours because you, you have enough proteins to live for 12 hours, but then you get really sick and you die within a week. So it used to be about half of the people that ate these would die, but now they have the milk thistle extract, this injectable, and that helps a whole lot. So now so it's... So it's available in Mexico because I heard it stopped being available in the U.S. It was never available in the U.S., but if you know somebody who... Um, it's also not illegal, it's not a controlled substance, it's just not approved in this country. So my friend Todd Mitchell, he's the world expert on amanita poisoning, and if you know anybody that eats one of these deadly mushrooms, you can call me and I'll call Todd, and we will um, send via FedEx this uh, life-saving medicine, and, um, and we can save a lot of lives that way. So now it's down to like 10% mortality, which is pretty good. Um, also really helps to remove the gallbladder. Um, but if that doesn't work, then you can, um, then you can do a liver transplant. Uh, a new liver is $800,000 with installation. <laughs> so it's a last resort, but, it's, um, but not very many people die from these anymore. Uh, also, partly due to the internet, you know, these days, instead of just eating mushrooms, I mean, so these taste fine, you know, there's no weird flavor that would indicate that it's poisonous. But instead of just eating mushrooms, you're supposed to post pictures on the internet first, 
And um, I think the last slide gives some examples of web websites where you can do that. And then a whole lot of experts will tell you if it's good or not. And of course, there's a lot of idiots on the internet too, and somebody, you know, not everyone knows everything. But the cool thing is, like some of these forums on the internet, they'll be a, like have 100,000 people on the forum. So if somebody misidentifies it, you know, just two or three minutes later, 10 other people come along and be like, no, don't eat it, that's, <laughs> that's wrong. And so, you know, one person can always be wrong, but everybody is never wrong. So it's a pretty good way to do it. As um, long as you get a decent picture of something, you can get it pretty safely identified in the internet. So this one's actually a new species. There's a bunch of uh, new species of uh, deadly amanitas in Mexico, and most of them are white. Uh, not all of them. There's no death caps in Mexico, but they do have this. This is the Latin American death cap, and it has a brown cap instead of the green cap that uh, regular death caps have. I'm assuming that one has a bulbous base under the bulb? Yeah, totally bulbous on the base, and you can peel away that vulva, but the stem itself is still really bulbous even after you've peeled that off. So these are some of my favorite mushrooms. These are mycenas. And, um, really cool thing about Mycenas is they're very much understudied because they're really small and a lot of them glow in the dark. So this one I found in Oaxaca and I found it at 3 in the morning and um, this is just taken with the flash. But then if you don't use a flash, it looks more like this. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. So this is actually how it really looks. And um, So I first found the glow in the dark mushrooms in 2012. I'm um, just on some liquid amber bark, and um, I you know, told all the Mexican mycologists, you know, showed the pictures to Gaston Guzman, and he's like, wow, there's never been a r record of any glow-in-the-dark mushrooms in Mexico before. Turns out they're not rare at all. In fact, in some habitats, they're really common. But it's just that nobody had walked without any flashlights through the woods in Mexico before and uh, published their findings. So I started doing this all the time. Um, so Alonzo and I spent years, um, we would like, start mushroom hunting about 7, 8 p.m. when it got dark and just walk for hours with no light whatsoever. Um, or sometimes when we find them, we'd use you know, the red headlamp to set up the photos. And uh, yeah, then about 4 a.m., go to bed and do the same thing. So we did that for months and months, and we found 23 different species of glow-in-the-dark mushrooms. Isn't helping and so, being drunk to do this? What's that? Isn't help being drunk to do this? Uh, it actually helps a lot if you're sober. Because um, being drunk and walking through the woods without any light whatsoever is super dangerous. Uh, it also really helps to wear glasses, because then your, your vision is a little bit better, but it, then you don't poke your eyes out. That's the main reason I wear glasses. Uh, Alonzo usually smokes a ton of weed when we're doing this. Um, that works for him. I, I prefer to be sober, because I feel like I find a little bit more that way. Um, this one's really cool. Um, because this one I found in both Jalisco and Veracruz, and the stem glows really brightly. So when you find this one in the dark, it looks just like a vertical line in the woods. But the cap glows, and the mycelium glows as well. So you can see the leaves that it's uh, growing off of. It's growing on oak leaves here, and the leaves itself glow. But the mushrooms glow even brighter than the leaves. This is my favorite one, and this one we found in Veracruz. And um, the reason why it's so cool, even though it's really dim, is that the edges of the gills glow. Oh, so this was a 40 minute exposure, um, and I had to leave the shutter open for 40 minutes because the, the glow is so dim that it just took forever to pick it up on film. But um, it's a really cool looking one, and we found it a bunch of times now, but it's really hard to find because it's so hard to see. Just Barely, like if I didn't have like, glasses on and you know, a bunch of people with really sharp eyesight looking with me, I probably would never see it, but really like those. And this one's pretty cool because just the stem glows and the mycelium doesn't glow and neither does the cap. And this is the first one that I found in 2012 that only grows on liquid amber. Um, so these liquid embers, they're in the cloud forest and the trunks are always covered in moss and on the really mossy side, you'll find these little tiny pink mushrooms. And After a while, we start to get to know these species really well. So we can just find them during the day and then just save them. So here's just some that we grabbed during the day and brought them home and photographed um, in our house. So we didn't have to like set up a tripod um, in the middle of the night, which works, but it's really hard. This one's really cool because we found it in a coffee plantation. 
and only the base of the stem glows. So the base of the stem glows green, and then the rest of the light that you see here is from the moon. So what I should have done probably is I like covered the whole thing with a big blanket so I didn't have the moon lighting it up, and then you would just see the base of the stem. But that's what we did. That's how it turned out. This one's really cool because the mushroom does not glow at all, but the mycelium glows. So this is a, this is a beech leaf, and at night it looks like that. So if you look, you can see the places that are glowing green here are the places that are much lighter in color because the mycelium metabolizes a lot of the molecules and bleaches it out. So, um, How did you discover that? Lots of walking at night just without any lights and find, finding glowing leaves. And actually it's pretty easy to find glowing leaves. So we just, co we just uh, collect every leaf that's glowing and then after about an hour we turn the lights on and we just have a basket full of glowing leaves and we just dig through the glowing leaves really carefully to look for mushrooms that are growing off of it. And what we found is that a lot of these um, leaves that were glowing, they had this mycena that did not glow coming off of it. And then we realized that it was that mycena that was doing it. What makes the ones without mushrooms glow? What's that? The ones that glow that don't have mushrooms growing on them. Oh, it's the same thing. It's like sometimes the mycelium is fruiting and sometimes it's not fruiting. So if it's not fruiting, then it's just like a real... But it's due to the mycelium. It's due to the mycelium, exactly. Yeah. And like, uh, there's other things that glow. We found a lot of glow worms, which I think are firefly larvae. Um, and there's glowing bacteria and stuff like that. Um, the thing to look for is, you know, the glow worms are like a point source. So if you see just a little point, but it's pretty bright, I don't even bother looking at it because it's a glow worm every time. Whereas if it's a much more spread out light, then it's like coming from a mushroom or a mycelium. And sometimes it's really beautiful. Like there'll be thousands of these leaves all over the forest floor. And it looks just like oceans of glowing leaves. It's really something else. Has anybody cultured that? No one has cultured this specific one. Um, let's see, some of them, one of those I brought a spore print back from, and I tried to culture it, and it just didn't germinate. But um, definitely needs to be cultured. That would be, it's, it's definitely possible to grow the, uh, the glowing mycenas. It's just kind of, you know, the spores are white spore of really thin cell walls. They don't last very long. So probably need to bring some petri dishes down there. I'm just and thinking if we can culture that and maybe grow it on cellulose, like yeah, um, sawdust block, yeah, or sugarcane. If we sterilize and culture it on the underwear, we could have bioluminescent underwear. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a dreamer. Or just for your garden, it'd be really awesome to have a garden that glows. <laughs> 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 This one is really cool. <laughs> this one grows on liquid amber seed pods. But it's super tiny, so these mushrooms are only one millimeter across when they're fully mature. And the mushrooms don't glow at all. But the mycelium glows, and even more, the primordia glows. So those are just little primordia that are just about to hatch out in the mushrooms, and as soon as they hatch out, they stop glowing. But at that point, they do glow. And then this is the brightest one by far. Um, so this is a Mycena, and this is one that I discovered in the state of Hidalgo in the beach cloud forest there. And it's really cool. This is a picture here um, with just a little bit of LED illumination. Um, and then this is how it looks in pitch blackness. So only the calc glows. The mycelium doesn't glow at all and the stem doesn't glow either. But it glows so brightly that if you take one of these caps and hold it up to your eye in broad daylight, you will see, uh, you'll see the glowing just in broad daylight. And most of these, you got to let your eyes adjust a whole lot. And this is a lobster mushroom. Um, really good edible. Parasitizes rusula. Super popular. They call it Ongo langostina. Alex? Yep. No, I was just wondering back to bioluminescence. Have you ever encountered any um, fungal luminescence that's not green? No. All, the, all of the fungi always emit the exact same wavelength of green light. In fact, everything in, on land uh, emits the exact same species of green light, except for some worms that are in a cave in New Zealand, and those glow more blue. And then okay. down in the ocean, there's some different colors, like blue. What if but, we found some wood chips that were glowing blue? <laughs> that'd be cool. Yeah, I would like to see them. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you should uh, throw it on the auger and see if you can get the auger plates to glow. Um, I got like Pinellas Stipticus glowing in auger, and um, yeah, the petri dishes themselves glow pretty well. 
And then when you fruit it, it gets about three times brighter. That might be bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Another question? We have, we have some uh, insects that glow blue in Western North Carolina. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, blue ghosts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that'd be cool to photograph those. Yeah. They're, very, yeah. they're very famous. Dupont gets stormed every year when they, yeah. uh, when they come the out. The lottery yeah. system. Yeah. So it was like a chemical reaction between the luciferin and luciferase. And um, yeah, it makes a photon of light and the chemicals react with mm -hmm. oxygen. This here is Strepharia. It's like Strepharia cornella type thing. Um, grows in grass. Kind of looks like a magic mushroom, but no matter how much you beat it up, it doesn't stain blue. But you can see the gills are turning this dark purple brown color, just like in Psilocybe. Here's another one that looks even more like magic mushrooms. This is a Strepharia. Um, it's one of the rare Strepharias. It has an annulus on there. Um, but these are really fragile. You can see the caps are cracking already. And um, all the Strepharias are very fragile and edible. And then here's one that grows on dung. There's Peniolus and Theorum, and Tellurum in English. And um, I always find it on cow manure, occasionally in horse manure. So this is native to Europe, because um, cows, came, cows and horses came to Mexico about 500 years ago. Um, but here's another one that grows on dung, and this one does stain blue, Copalandia cyanescens. So when the stem breaks, the psilocin stains blue, and that's how you know it's one of the hallucinogenic mushrooms. Um, turns out Mexico has more species of hallucinogenic mushrooms than any other country in the world. And that's because um, they have so much other diversity, so many different trees and so many different plants that they have you know, a whole lot of these. But this one also is native to Asia. Um, it came over with the cows, I was on cow manure. But most of the psilocybe in Mexico are not native to Asia. Uh, most of them are native to Mexico. There's one that only grows in the volcanoes that surround Mexico City, and it's called Psilocybe Aztecorum. And this is the habitat for Psilocybe Aztecorum. So this is really high up, like 10,000 feet elevation. And the only pine tree that can grow that high is Pinus heartwegii. And then this is uh, Nevada de Toluca up here, which is a, um, an extinct volcano. It hasn't erupted in a couple hundred years. And this is the habitat for Psilocybe Aztecorum. It grows in along, among the Pinus heartwegii. And um, this grass here only grows at really high elevation. And that's what it looks like. Um, really cool veil. And the gills turn purple as the spores mature. It's got really cool rhizomorphs at the base of the stem. And sometimes you find a whole lot of it. If you go to Nevada de Toluca, like the end of the season, like September, early October, this could be the most common mushroom out there. Um, but for some reason, the people in Mexico City have not figured out about this, because you go up there and there's just nobody out there picking mushrooms. And the people that are picking mushrooms are going for edibles. <coughs> and um, the people at Humboldt State University let me use their scanning electron microscope, so I was able to bring a little bit of it and get some cool pictures of it. Um, unfortunately, there's only one color of electrons, so you get black and white. But electrons are way smaller than photons, so you can magnify a whole lot more. So you can see. Um, on one side, there's the germ pore, this dimple thing, and that's where the spores germinate out of. And then on the other side, there's the hilar appendage, and that's where the spores attach to the sterigmata and the basidia. <coughs> and then this one is uh, Psilocybe banderiensis. It's really hard to find because it only occurs in the cloud forest of Veracruz and Oaxaca. And it's really hard to notice because it doesn't stain blue very much. Um, it does stain blue, but it has so much dark pigment in it, like reddish brown pigment. You can't really see it. So really hard to find, but um, pretty neat to find. Kind of smells like cucumbers and oil paint. <laughs> uh, most of the psilocybin mushrooms just smell like cucumber, but occasionally some of them have other odors on top of that. Uh, here's the habitat for psilocybe silver lessons. This is Volcan de Fuego, the volcano of fire in Colima. And this one uh, erupts all the time. You'll often see photos of it erupting on the news. Um, but this is one of the dry stream beds there. So there's no mushrooms in the middle. And then in the sides, there's like little tiny tropical white sport stuff. But on the, um, on the, just on the very, like the vertical walls here, you'll find Psilocybe saber lessons. Mm -hmm. And um, you can go up those canyons for miles and find patches of them every couple hundred yards. And these are Psilocybe saber lessons from this place called the Sawmill. 
And so there used to be a sawmill that they shut down about 15 years ago, and now there's just woody debris everywhere. And these are wood lovers, so they love this woody debris, and now there's just thousands of Solosity Silver Lessons all over this sawmill. And grows in big clusters sometimes. And uh, we found just a whole ton of them one day. And so we picked all of them and piled them all up, and we're like, wow, this is a really cool spot. And then this guy rode up, and the horse is like, hey, what are you guys doing here? And we're like, oh, we're looking for mushrooms. And the guy's like, oh, cool, yeah, um, I love mushrooms. And so he told us we can come back whenever we want, and the house is never locked. And so now we visit that sawmill every year and stay in the house and hunt mushrooms there. And there's thousands of Mexican hippies looking for this place, but nobody's ever found it. <laughs> <laughs> what is the culture like with regard to the hallucinogenic mushrooms? Well, we found these in Jalisco. And in Jalisco, the only people that know about hallucinogenic mushrooms are like the friends of Fulvio, the biolog my, friend, my biologist friend there. So Jalisco is kind of mycophobic, and most of Mexico is kind of mycophobic. But as you get towards Mexico City and Puebla and Oaxaca, those people have been eating the hallucinogenic mushrooms for thousands of years. It's part of their religion. And um, so they, are, they like mushrooms a lot. When you get into those regions, you'll see people just selling edible mushrooms along the side of the road, like families with blankets, spreading all the mushrooms out over the blankets and stuff. So these mushrooms are pretty hard to find in Oaxaca because everybody knows what they look like, and they pick them pretty quick, and they know all the spots. Um, but like over in Jalisco, like if we didn't pick them, they would just rot away. And you can see they stain blue pretty well. That's the silicon oxidizing. And a lot of times we'll bring these to the fungus fairs to teach all the Mexican people about all the different mushrooms that grow uh, in their country. And here we are. Uh, the police are looking at the spores of Psilocybe Saber Lessons. Um, these police are not very good at identifying mushrooms uh, with the microscope because they didn't arrest me. Um, but actually, these police are really nice. And they tease me for finding magic mushrooms, and I tease them for being corrupt. <laughs> Well, this fungus fair is really good. It happens the second week of August every year in San Diego, Michoacan. And um, it's run by the city. It's like free, and they um, pay the villagers to bring pickup trucks full of mushrooms to the fair. And then I will identify them all, put names on all of them, and then put them out on display. And it's a really cool event. There's another fungus fair in Oaxaca. It's like the second week of July. And um, that one costs like 500 pesos, and they have a big contest to see which group can find all the different mushrooms. There's five or six fungus fairs in Mexico, and they're all really fun, really cool, um, really cool events to go to. So what I do is I just uh, go down to Mexico for the first fungus fair, and then travel from fungus fair to fungus fair. And when there's no fungus fair happening, I just wander around, explore the woods, and take pictures of mushrooms. This is Salasabi Cerulipes, and these are described from Michigan. Um, one of the few psilocybin mushrooms that occurs in the United States. I should have mentioned that the psilocybe, uh, psilocybe saber lessons, these ones here, um, these occur in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia. They just recently got found in Texas. They were described from Alabama by Merle in 1923. But then um, in 1996, Paul Stamets found them in, um, around Atlanta. and. He looked at it under the microscope and he found a bunch of pleurosystidia and he's like, wow, this is a new species. And so he published it as Psilocybe wileyi. But it um, turns out that we got a hold of the holotype the, that Merle found in 1923, because I keep it at the New York Botanical Gardens, and it was full, full of pleurosystidia as well, which means that Paul Stamets didn't really discover a new species, he just renamed this one that was already named. <laughs> so Psilocybe Cerulescens has 12 different names. Do we have a question? What are those plants that are growing? Um, that's a good question. And, you know, it's really hard because this is kind of a low elevation place. I found these in a landslide. And I do not know what that plant is. Um, are those mushrooms edible or not? They're hallucinogenic. Oh, so yeah, okay. you definitely see colors and stuff. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I found that it's kind of annoying to eat these because if you eat a whole bunch of them, you'll see colors and you'll feel really... Um, really different, but it's kind of hard to think. But then you'll feel better for months afterwards, like weeks and months afterwards as an antidepressant effect. But you don't actually have to eat that much to get the antidepressant effect. So usually when I eat them now, I'll eat just like half a cap. 
and it's enough where I don't feel anything at all from the mushroom, but I still get that good feeling that lasts for weeks and months afterwards. So Psilocybe cerulipes, uh, described from Michigan, but you find it on beech wood, and there's very few beech trees left in Mexico because climate changed a few thousand years ago, and most of them died out. But there's a couple of volcanoes, and way down um, hidden in the craters, there's beach forests. Mm -hmm. And so Alonzo and I decided that we would go to these beach forests and see if we could find Salonsobi Cerulipes. And the first day we were looking, we found them. And they're kind of distinctive because they have a really broad umbo. So a little bump in the cap that's really rounded. And um, <coughs> a lot of people in this country find them too on beach. Usually, but occasionally on birch and other hardwoods, sometimes maple. It's also hallucinogenic? Yep, so everything in Psilocybe is hallucinogenic, mm -hmm. except for one species, Psilocybe atrobrinea, which lost the ability to produce psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And then this one is Psilocybe cubensis. It's a name from Cuba, but they're native to Asia. And this is the only mushroom that you'll find in a Grateful Dead show. And that's because they're super easy to grow. They like practically grow themselves. So. <laughs> It's really um, interesting because they have a ring on the stem, and then they have these dark purple brown spores, and you don't have to spore print them because you can just look at the ring, and all the spores fall down and land on the ring, and then you see the spore print color right there. Is that what would be called a, a golden teacher? Yeah, so golden teacher is like a certain strain that's been isolated from the wild. The golden teachers are Psilocybe cubensis, and there's hundreds of different strains that people trade around. They're all pretty much the same. <laughs> <coughs> and here's one that I found growing in the middle of the road, because they have cows in the middle of the road. And then Psilocybe figicola grows in the cloud forests of Veracruz and Oaxaca. Um, smells like cucumbers and oil paints. Um, pretty cool looking thing. They're really small. I guess they're probably really strong. And so um, here I took all of the Psilocybe figicola that I found and put them all in the same um, spot in my tackle box. And that turned out to be a really bad idea. Uh, because when we got these home, we started looking at them under the microscope. And half of them had just one type of chylosostidia, and the other half had two types of chylosostidia. I realized there's two different species that look just the same when you find them. But actually, they have um, different DNA sequence and different, um, <laughs> different microscopic features. So now when I find these things, I take a picture of them, and then I write down the number of the, um, the photo number on, on a little slip of paper and put them into their own little compartment so all the collections stay separate, and that way you can always correlate the photos with the DNA sequences and microscopy. And these usually don't stain blue very much because they have like a lot of red color in them, but this one I was able to see a little bit of blue on. And then this one is Psilocybe hymii. This one is usually lighter in color, and it has the little point on the cap that usually goes off to the right or left. And so when they're older, the, the gills are purple, but when they start out, the gills are this cream color, and then when the spores mature, the gills change color to purple. This one looks a lot like Psilocybe hoopshigenii, but it's not. This is Entheloma. So um, Entelomas don't stain blue no matter how much you beat them up. But this one is Psilocybe hoopshigenii, and it's one of the coolest looking magic mushrooms in the world. And um, in Mexico, it only grows in Oaxaca. And it took me 10 years to find it. So I was looking and looking and looking, and finally, um, this summer, I went out to a really remote mountain called Sierra Mije. And um, Alonzo and I found about a dozen of these out there. This is one that was collected by Gordon Wasson in 1959 and preserved in alcohol. And here's one that was uh, collected by Maria Sabina uh, in the 60s. And then Psilocybe mexicana uh, grows in grasslands and has a really strong cucumber odor. And a lot of people collect these. They're pretty popular, pretty strong. And then Psilocybe meridionalis. Um, this is the most recently discovered psilocybin mushroom in Mexico. It was discovered in 2005 in a place called Sierra de Cacoma. This is a very remote mountain in Jalisco that nobody ever goes to. So I went there and I looked and looked a lot and couldn't find it. So I went there the next year and looked a lot and couldn't find it. And went there the next year and still couldn't find it. So I went to the herbarium where they keep all of the type collections. And so this is the holotype collection of Psilocybe meridionalis. 
And so when you uh, describe a new species of mushroom, you keep a type collection, and that's the official reference collection. So when people want to see exactly which mushroom it was that you found, they check the holotype. Um, so I opened up the box, and I was very pleasantly surprised to see that there was some good collection notes, including GPS coordinates for exactly where they found it. So armed with the GPS coordinates, I went back to Sierra de Cacoma, and this is the hillside here um, where they, they collected the holotype, and it wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got to wait till it rains really good, and then go back and check this hillside. And then this is uh, the habitat for Psilocybe malurcula. And this is one of the landslide mushrooms that grows in really high elevations. So it really needs cold weather to fruit. And so this is Pocopitepetl. And this is one of the dry stream beds there. So up on the sides here, there's a lot of edibles, lots of lactarius and amanita and porcini. And then down in the middle is where the water flows. There was no mushrooms. But here on the, on the vertical walls, you'll find the Psilocybe malurcula. And it looks like that, it's growing from the vertical walls. These are really old ones, because the uh, gills have turned purple. But um, usually, in this species, it takes a long time for the gills to turn purple. So usually, when you find them, the gills are white. And then here is Psilocybe neohalapensis, named after Jalapa. And we're actually going to change the name of this, because this was discovered in the 80s. But in the 70s, there's one called Psilocybe furta duana, which was discovered in Brazil. Turns out they're synonymous, so this Brazilian name takes precedence. And the gills start out white, and they're just starting to turn purple as the spores mature. And here is the first time ever that this mushroom has been found in Oaxaca. Uh, so also be subtropicalis is one that grows with oaks, and it's the only one that I find growing from oak leaves. And I see that in Jalisco, or no, in Veracruz and in Oaxaca. And then Psilocybe youngensis has really cool microscopic features. This is the chylocystidia here, so the cells on the very edges of the gill. And you see they're like bifurcate and trifurcate sometimes. And there's no other Psilocybe that does that. But you find it, and it's like um, the only one that I find growing directly from wood. And so this here is the log that goes. Um, along this creek, if you've seen the Hamilton Morris uh, Vice episode, where Hamilton Morris um, finds all the psilocybes up at the quorum, that's the landslide that I took him to. But down at the base of the landslide, there's this creek, and the log goes over the creek, and the psilocybe youngensis, the fruits from the log. And it's really cool looking. Sometimes there's just thousands of them coming out of the logs. And in this picture, you can see that there is a little metal bar up there in the corner, which I forgot to Photoshop out. And um, that's because there's a white umbrella. So it was like sun hitting these mushrooms. And you never really want to photograph mushrooms when the sun's hitting it, because you get way too much contrast. And the shadows are way too sharp. It just won't look good. So I used a white umbrella to diffuse the sun and give it a nice soft light. And then you also you can't see it, because it's just out of the frame. But right here in front uh, of the mushrooms, I put a big reflector. And it reflects a little bit of light. Uh, this bounces it back up onto the gills and onto the upper stem. And that's how you get a really good professional mushroom photograph. So you don't really need a really nice camera or anything like that to get a really good professional photograph. Um, you can use your cell phone, but you do need uh, to make sure there's no direct sunlight hitting the mushrooms. And you need to bounce some light back up onto the gills. So you can do that with just a white sheet of paper or a white t-shirt or just anything that's white, like a white tackle box. And um, the other really important thing is to set the mushrooms up really nice. So, you know, in nature, you'll find like one mushroom over here and one mushroom over there. But if you're taking a really nice picture for a field guide, you want to move them all so they're all in the same focal plane. And then some of them should be laying down so you can see the gills and all the features in one shot. And here's what they look like when they're young. And some older ones. And there's the habitat there. And what I usually do is set up a tripod so then I can use a macro lens and the DSLR and set the camera for like ISO 100, which makes the exposure really long. So you need the tripod, but it also gives you really high quality images. So if you blow the images up really big and make a poster out of it, the poster is not grainy. It's a nice, smooth image. 
And then I set the f-stop to like f22, and that way you got all of the mushrooms in focus at once because the depth of field is wide. And uh, that makes the exposure about two seconds long, so you need like a time release so the camera's not shaking as you press the shutter. So you set your camera up that way, you'll get really nice pictures. And then here's the very last mushroom that I'll talk about today, and then I'll take questions if you have any. This one is Psilocybes zepheticorum, and this one grows on landslides. So landslides happen all the time in Oaxaca because this, um, the ground isn't very stable. This is a huge landslide that goes for hundreds of meters. Um, so you just go along until you find these landslides. You can find them on Google Earth pretty easily. And then it's some of the most dangerous mushroom hunting I've ever done because they're extremely unstable. And when the rain comes in, all the rocks just fall down. Um, but it's really fun because these mushrooms, uh, the zapticorum grows at the base of the landslides. And usually at the base of these things, there's a creek. So down by the water is where you find them. Um, here's Alonzo, and I took him to my Psilocybe zapticorum spot in Jalisco. And um, sometimes we've seen them growing all out throughout that moss, like in 2007, 2008. But this was 2015, and now they've moved down over in there. And so... Um, and take our shoes off to get pictures of this one. And uh, up close, it looks like this. And we thought this is such a beautiful cluster of mushrooms. You know, the last thing we need is more psychedelic mushrooms. We'll just leave them there. And so we just left them there to sporulate into the water and complete their life cycle. But a couple hours later, um, we were up above here just hunting for edibles. And these hippies are like, Alan, and we look over, and it's some guys that I knew. And um, <laughs> We ended up hunting mushrooms with them, but we looked in the trunk of their car and they had this exact cluster of mushrooms in the trunk of their car. <laughs> <laughs> Those friends of Fulvio, and he showed them the, the spot too. Uh, but a lot of times they're really prolific. Sometimes there's thousands of them. These were some I found in Michoacan. And the people in Michoacan don't really know anything about mushrooms, so they just rot away if nobody picks them. Uh, they stain blue really well. So this is a really young one. The spores have not matured yet. I thought that would be ideal, so I just pinched it with my finger, and about 30 seconds later, took this photo. And this photo was actually taken in broad daylight, and you can take mushroom pictures in broad daylight with a back black background. If you turn the ISO low, and then close the aperture, and then turn on the flash, so that way, like, all of the light that's hitting the mushroom comes from the flash. So even though I was just standing in the sun, it doesn't look like it because the flash was so much brighter. And this is uh, some from the sawmill. I really like to, like to photograph these because the stem has these cool squamules on them. This is uh, another volcano that surrounds Mexico City. This is um, the, the volcano that Robert Kelly lives on. And then some from Jalisco. And uh, some more from Jalisco. So this is like at the base of one of those landslides. And some more from Michoacan. And it's hard to find them in Oaxaca, but there's some that I did find in Oaxaca. And the sun had dried them out and that broke a lot of the cells. It allowed the silicon to react with oxygen and stain them blue. And here's some that I just um, kind of pinched with my finger and made them turn blue. So that's all I have for you. Um, I'll take questions in a minute, but I'll quickly tell you about some of my favorite mushroom websites. Um, so the best one is mushroomobserver.org. I upload all of my pictures to mushroomobserver.org, and that keeps a permanent record of all of the different mushrooms that I found. And that way, if I want to pull up one of my photos because I'm making a talk, or I want to show them to somebody, or I just um, you know, lose my computer and still want to have the pictures, then they're there forever, and they save the full resolution photo, so it's really nice. And, so you guys can upload your, your mushroom pictures to mushroomobserver.org, and you put it on there, and then everyone votes on what kind of mushroom you have. So as long as your pictures are good and you show not only the top of the cap, but kind of like the gills, the underside too, you'll get really good identifications. And the people that check Mushroom Observer are really sharp, and they know identification really well. Um, so that's just a website. There's no app or anything. But iNaturalist does have an app. And the iNaturalist app is really fun because you just run this app and then you use the app to take pictures instead of using your like camera or whatever. 
But then as soon as you get cell phone service or if you're in a place with service, automatically it just uploads all of your pictures to iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is cool in that it's not just mushrooms, it's everything alive. So you can take pictures of trees and people will identify the trees for you. All the different plants. Um, I've started to take pictures of every plant that I see if I don't recognize it. I just snap a picture, it takes me just a couple seconds. It goes on to iNaturalist. Um, there's a lot of like, Mexican plant experts that will really quickly uh, identify all my plants. I just got back from two weeks in Baja, California, and the guy that wrote the book on Baja, California plants checks iNaturalist every day. So at the end of every day, he will identify all of my plant pictures, and so I learn a whole lot about plants that way. Um, and it works pretty well for mushrooms, but it's not as good as Mushroom Observer in that in Mushroom Observer, everyone is like, um, kind of like checks all the different mushrooms and you have a lot of different eyes looking at your observations. Where an iNaturalist, it may or may not get identified. If you're lucky, it will. Um, if not, you might have to bug some experts and um, ask in some other places. Um, but, you know, it's another good database website and it's, it's really nice that they have the app. And then the Shroomery is a magic mushroom website um, with the forums, so you can like post on there and people are really good at identifying psilocybin mushrooms, but they're also very good at identifying poisonous mushrooms and edible mushrooms. And it's more of just like a place to chat and share your photos and stuff like that. So that's a pretty good website. And then Mushroom Expert is totally different in that Mushroom Expert is like an online field guide. And that's written by Michael Kuo, who lives in Chicago. And he's written, uh, he's got most of the North American mushrooms on there. He doesn't have any psilocybin mushrooms on there because he hates hippies, but other than that, it's a really good website. And if it's not a psilocybin mushroom, you'll be able to key it out on there. And like, you know, usually you buy these expensive field guides and they got keys in the back and you can key it out on there, but the Mushroom Expert also has keys for almost everything. And they're getting really good. Um, Ten years ago when he started the site, he was pretty new and people joked like he should have called it like mushroomnovice.com or something. But he's gotten really good now. and. Um, he keeps updating it all the time, so it's um, it's a really good website. Just if you, you know, go on there and use it like a field guide, you know. And any, anytime you buy a field guide, it's going to be out of date. Like the Audubon guide is you know, 30 years old, and it's um, it's not a bad book, but it's not a good book because it's super old. And you know, Gary Linkoff wrote it when he just got into mushrooms. He'd only been hunting for a couple of years when he wrote the Audubon guide. But there's a new um, North Carolina field guide. Or it's like Mushrooms of the Carolinas that was written by the Bassettes and came out just like a few weeks ago. And Very that is good. definitely the book to get for this area. Um, and then we got a few Facebook groups. And these are Facebook groups that I help run. So if anybody like insults you on there, just message me and I'll like tell them to stop or something. <laughs> uh, but like uh, the first one is the Mushroom ID forum. And there's like 50,000 people on there, so people will definitely insult you on there because uh, when you have that many people, you know, you just can't control them all. It's like herding cats. Um, but the cool thing about having 50,000 people is if somebody makes a mistake, then they will very quickly get corrected. And then uh, for DNA sequencing, I started this group called Fungal Sequencing, and it's just all about the DNA analysis on mushrooms. And another one um, that's pretty good is fungal microscopy, just all about microscope stuff. So if you want to learn all about um, how to use the microscope to identify mushrooms. And of course, it's really easy to pop a mushroom under the microscope and see this forest. But what's really hard is to interpret what you're seeing and turn all the hundreds of different shapes that you see under the microscope into actual data and actual information. That's really difficult. So it helps to be a member of some of these groups and just post your stuff on there and see what people think. And uh, my email address, I'm super easy to get a hold of, Alan Rockefeller at Gmail. Thank you very much. Thank you.